Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to church this morning. This is Grace Chapel Online. I'm trusting that the Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. I will be speaking this morning on the topic, transformed by his presence. Transformed by his presence. Amen. Have you ever held a rubber stress ball in your hand and squeezed it? You will notice that the shape of the ball will conform to the shape of your hand. But as soon as you release it, as soon as you release the pressure, the ball will immediately be restored back to his original state. Do you know that that is how many believers act towards the word of God? that they hear, the word of God that they read, the word of God that they listen to. When they read that book, when they listen to that tape, when they hear that sermon, they say amen, and they agree with everything that has been said. No arguments at all. However, when they leave the meeting or put down the book, the pressure is off and they go back to the life to life the same way it was no difference has been made in their lives now then consider that you are holding a ball of clay or a play doh in the same hand and you squeeze it the ball would take the shape of your hand but this time when you release the pressure, you will find that the ball has been transformed into the shape of your hand and it will hold that shape. In as much as you have released your hands, the, the ball has taken the shape of your hand. In the same way, Spending time in God's presence allows the Holy Spirit to transform you into a new person. So it is important that as children of God, we go beyond seeing what needs to be changed and we become as clay or the play doh in the hands of the great porter by staying in his presence. If we merely conform to the word preached, taught, or read, when the pressure is released, you will see that the person goes back to who he was. But if you develop a closer relationship with the father, and you develop a closer relationship and acquaintance with his presence, because of the truth of the word of God, your life will change. The presence of God will change your life. For many years, I have been battled. Probably some of you have been. About how people can be part of a fellowship where the word of God is being taught and then they live ex the exact same way they came in. How is it that one can be living in sin as I was, show up in meetings week after week and not experience either conviction or freedom? Some people have tried to explain it erroneously. They think that the fact that this person is not changing is because the fellowship is not powerful or the presence of God is not there. The truth is that your transformation 
depends on the time that you spend with God personally, not just going to church or to fellowship. And so if you, there is no change in the lives of people, despite the quality of the word of God, the word of God undiluted that is being preached in any fellowship or any church, then the people need to go into the presence of God. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that what, um, what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How is it that one can stand in God's presence and not change? The truth is they cannot. What do I mean? If one says they stand in the presence of God and they are not changing, they are not standing in the presence of God. If you are not changing, it means you are not standing in God's presence. And you should be gravely concerned about your relationship with him. And you should do something about your relationship with him. You might just find that you are playing church game. You might just find that you are playing religion. And like the Pharisees did. And you do not have a relationship. It's time to wake up and smell the spiritual coffee. This morning, I want you to examine yourself as I ask the following questions. Is God's will truly important in your life? Or are there other things that tend to rule? Do you truly want to know him? The person of God? Or do you want to know about him? Do you love the word of God? Or do you find it a drag to read? Do you find it a boring book? Does sin bother you to your very core? Or do you accept it the way it is like the rest of the world? Do you feel more hungry to know God more? Or do you feel satisfied with the current, your current relationship level with God? Do you sin in your mind and in your life? Are you involved in pornography, sexual deviancy, alcohol, and um, drug addictions, hatred, jealousy, unthankfulness, unforgiveness, and the like? Do you feel trapped in some kind of slavery and unable to break free? Are you being transformed or are you staying in the same place? I know that these are hard questions, hard questions to ask. And they don't feel good to ask them. Neither do they feel good to answer them. But let us be serious, brothers and sisters. Jesus said that you can't have two masters. You either serve one and leave the other. You can't play on two teams. It will be one or the other. We must come into intimate relationship with God. You cannot come to God carrying the world with you. When you are carrying the world with you, you limit the presence of God in your life. The word of God has the power to transform. But that transformation happens in the presence of God. My text this morning is from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 8. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. 
With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Praise the Lord. The account I have just read of Isaiah's vision begins with a phrase, in the year King Uzziah died. Up until this point, Isaiah had known only one occupant to the throne of his people, King Uzziah. King Uzziah had taken the throne at the age of 16 and reigned for 52 years. You'll find this in 2 Chronicles 26. As soon as he took the throne, he set himself to seek God, which began a period of remarkable prosperity. He waged war with the enemies of God and regained lost territory. However, in the last days of his life, he was lifted up in pride and died of leprosy because he burnt incense unto the Lord, which was supposed to be the duty of the priests only. Now, suddenly, the throne is empty. Hopelessness grew as the people questioned the future of their nation. What will happen to their lives? With a history of notorious kings that plunged them into sin. This was Isaiah, Isaiah's motiv motiv motivation to seek God's face and intercede for his nation. During these precious moments in the presence of God, in the presence of God, Isaiah's life was totally transformed. He saw this vision. His vision of a filled throne brought strong encouragement and hope during a time of uncertainty and despair. While beholding the awesome glory of the Lord, Isaiah was compelled to worship. He was compelled to repent. And he was compelled to service. From this scripture this morning, I'm going to be discussing four points. There may be some points in between them, but four main points. Of what, how the spirit, how his presence transforms. What can happen in his presence? What you will see in his presence? What you will experience in his presence? What was the first thing that Isaiah saw? What did he experience in this vision? The first thing we see is worship. When you are faced with the holy presence of God, all creatures, not only human beings, all creatures are compelled to react in one way or the other. The presence of God makes you to react. Some became angry, like the demons that came in, um, into Jesus' presence and demanded to know why he had come to torment them in Mark chapter 5, verse 7. Others are resentful. 
like the thief that was crucified alongside Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, verse 44. The centurion at the cross was amazed. He was amazed by Jesus when he died that he said in Matthew 27, verse 54b, truly, this was the son of God. When the crowd saw Jesus do miracles and signs, and when they saw him healing, and when they saw him feed the multitude from, from, from nothing, they reacted in wonder. There are many examples in scripture of how people react to God's presence. However, the most important point I want to bring out of this is that when you are confronted with the reality of the presence of God, worship is the only reaction that will transform your life. Worship is the only reaction that you can have to the presence of God that will transform your life. When we keep our eyes fixed on heaven and spend time in true worship of God, we are empowered to rise above the circumstances of life. We are empowered to change. We are empowered to be transformed. In our text this morning in verse 1, Isaiah saw the throne of God. He saw and had worship to the Lord. When you are in the presence of God, you will, re you will respond in spontaneous worship. Like Isaiah saw. This morning, as we look at this scripture, almost verse by verse, I want to encourage you not to just see this as a description, but to join in the experience with Isaiah. Join in this worship with Isaiah. As I look at this scripture and I take it phrase by phrase, I want you, your spirit to be elevated. I want you to begin to worship. I want you to connect to God. I want you to seek and test for the presence of God in your living room as you are watching this morning. Experience what Isaiah experienced and the Lord will grant it to us in the name of Jesus. First, what did he see? Isaiah sees God upon his throne. He saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. John 12, 41 says, John chapter 12, verse, verse 41 says that Isaiah saw Christ's glory and spake to him. This explains this vision and is a full proof that Jesus Christ is God. Because the one that Isaiah saw on the throne, according to John chapter 12, verse 41, is Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, God is seated on a throne of grace and through him, the way into the holies of ho uh, the holy of holy is open, and the, this throne that Isaiah saw, the Bible says, is high and lifted up, not only uh, 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 above other thrones, as it transcends other thrones, but it is over other thrones, as it rules and commands other thrones. Hallelujah. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. Psalm 29 verse 10 says, The Lord sits enthroned over the floor. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. See the sovereignty of the Lord. See the sovereignty of the eternal monarch. He sits upon the throne forever. Verse 1 says, The throne is high and lifted up above all competition, above all arguments, <clears throat> above all contradictions. The throne was exalted and majestic. The throne sets its occupants in a superior position. Hallelujah. Isaiah saw the throne of God, a throne of glory, which we must worship, a throne of government under which we must subject, a throne of grace to which we must come boldly. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. What else did he see? He saw his temple. His temple was filled with the manifestations of his glory and his train, as it were, the skirts of his robes filled the temple. You know, in those days, kings wore robes with long trains because they were difficult to maneuver and you couldn't do any work in them. So wearing a long train meant 
I am important enough that I don't have to work. I am a person of honor and dignity. Others must serve and wait upon me. God is honored. God is important. God is dignified. And the train of his robe fills the temple, my God. Th such a long train. Such a massive, a big train. His train fills the temple. And we are his temple. His church on earth is his temple. Filled with his glory. The church which is filled and rich and beautiful. Beautified with God's presence. What else did Isaiah see? Isaiah sees those that attended to the throne by whom his glory is celebrated and his government he served above the throne he saw hovering about it or near the throne holy angels called seraphim do you know the word seraphim means burners burners he saw seraphims bowing before it with their faces veiled with their wings declaring that they are ready to yield in obedience to all God's commands. And that even though they do not understand his reasons, even though they do not understand the reason of his counsels, even though they do not understand his governance, they do not probably do not understand his promises, but they are ready and willing to obey. All vain glory, all ambition, all ignorance, all pride will be done away with at one view of Christ in his glory. One view of his glory, one view of his presence will bring you to the point of obedience. Special note is taken of the wings of the seraphims. The Bible says that with two, the cover is um, their, their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they covered their face, meant that they could not bear the dazzling luster of divine glory. With two, they covered their feet, men spoke uh, uh, of great humility and reverence that they have for God. Psalm 89 verse 7 says, for he is greatly feared in the assembly of the saints. Hallelujah. He saw those that attended at the throne. And then what happened again? He heard the song of race. The seraphim sang with zeal and fervency. Hallelujah. They cried aloud and with unanimity. One cried to another, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. They worship the Lord for his infinite perfection in himself. They worship the Lord. They worship him for the excellence of his holiness. They worship him. They worship him as the Lord of hosts. They worship him. They worship him whose glory filled the earth. Hallelujah. We must worship God in songs with zeal and fervency. We must contemplate on his holiness. We must worship him for the perfection of his holiness. I hope that somebody has already begun to worship in their living room this morning. You must worship God with fervency. You must worship God with zeal. The seraphims called to one another. They said, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The earth is filled with his glory. Hallelujah. This is what Isaiah saw, and he was all struck. He saw it, and he was all struck as they cried, Holy. Suddenly, he began to contemplate. He began to contemplate. He began to contemplate the holiness of God. He began to contemplate the, whole, the, 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 the excellence of the holiness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope you are worshiping already in your sitting room. What else did you see? He saw the marks and tokens of awe and of terror that filled the temple. The Bible says in verse 4 that the house was shaken. 
not only the door, but even the doorposts that were already firmly fixed, they began to move. Why? At the voice of him that cried, at the voice of the angels as they sang, at the voice of the angels as they cried out. The whole place began to shake. The whole place began to move. Hallelujah. Isaiah was awestruck. And then what did he see again? The Bible says the house was filled with smoke. The smoke reminds us of the pillar of cloud in Exodus 13 that led the children of Israel out. The smoke reminds us of the smoke in Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 verse 8. That smoke, that cloud reminds us of the Shekinah glory that filled the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 to 12. A cloud of glory often marks the presence of God. Isaiah saw, hallelujah, Isaiah saw the house filled with smoke. The temple of God was filled with smoke, hallelujah. Glory be to God, hallelujah. His, his all-filled vision of the divine majesty that he experienced, that he saw, overwhelmed the prophets. It overwhelmed the prophets with a sense of his own vileness. That he said in verse 5, War is me. War is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. My eyes have seen the King. The Lord of hosts, when you stand in the presence of the Almighty God, when the presence of God manifests, when you see the manifest presence of God, then you begin to see who you are. Then you begin to see what is in your heart. Then you begin to see, compared to this majesty, compared to this awesomeness, Compared to this holiness, you are a nobody. Hallelujah. I'm saying that there are four things, four things that happened to Isaiah. And all things that happened to Isaiah, the first one was worship. Hallelujah. The second one was repentance. The result of being in God's presence is a revelation of God's glory. The revelation of God's glory reveal to him the condition of his own heart. As I'm hoping this morning that the presence of God that has already descended in this service this morning, that the presence of God that has already descended in this service this morning will reveal to you the condition of your heart and your need for repentance. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when faced with the awesome holiness of God, Isaiah cried out in verse 5. He said, war is me, I am undone. War is me, I am undone. Isaiah recognized the need for repentance. Maybe Isaiah's life was as brilliant as a diamond. But when you lay a diamond against a perfectly black background, and you have the right light upon it, you can see every flaw and every imperfection. Flaws that were invisible before. Even so, when Isaiah's righteous life lay against the background of God's perfection, it looked different. And Isaiah began to say, I am undone. If God would deal with me in strict justice, for I have made myself obnoxious to his displeasure because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner. Particularly, I have offended in word. Who is it that has not offended in word? We all have reason to express this before the Lord. That we are of unclean lips ourselves. Our lips are consecrated to God. For we are not giving God the first fruit of our lips. As the Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 15, rather we are giving other fruits. 
And so, we, our lips need to be cleaned. <coughs> we are of unclean lips. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he knew what kind of a man he was. As poorly as he compared to the seraphim, that was nothing in relation to how he compared to the Lord. And I'm asking you this morning, how do you think you will compare to the seraphim in your worship? How do you think you will compare to the Lord in his radiancy and his holiness? By nature, our lips are full of flattery and false intent. With flattering lips and a double heart, we speak. That's what Psalm 12 verse 2 says. By nature, our lips are proud. Let the lying lips be put to silence. We speak insolent things proudly and contentiously against the righteous. That is what Psalm 31 verse 18 says. By nature, our lips deceive. Psalm 34 verse 13 says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. By nature, our lips are violent. Psalm 140 verse 3 says, swords are in their lips. Swords. That's Psalm 50, 59 verse 7, sorry. And then Psalm 140 verse 3 says, the poison of asp is under their lips. By nature, our lips can bring death to others. God forbid. Isaiah was probably a righteous and godly man by all outward appearance. But when he saw the throne of the king, when he heard the seraphim shouting, holy, 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 he suddenly realized, realized his estate. He suddenly realized he was unclean. This morning, we are in the presence of the Almighty God. May you humble yourself and come down from that high horse. May you throw away that pretense and that hypocrisy. May you look inward and be honest with yourself and go before God in repentance, seeking for his presence today as you seek for forgiveness. May you repent of those, all those hard-heartedness. May you repent of reasoning out the word of God and giving it interpretation that suits you, but that is against his will. God have mercy on us. You can repent of your sins today and deliver and be delivered by the almighty God into this, the kingdom of his dear son. Repentance towards God is the only requirement for entering into his kingdom. Repentance is simply turning from your way of running your life and giving your life to Jesus. He alone can open the door by cleansing you from your sin and purifying your heart. If you would like to do this, you would like to give your life to Christ. You would like to move away from your sin. None of us can help ourselves. You want to give the control of your life to Jesus today. For a minute, bow your head and say after me, Lord Jesus, for too long I have kept you out of my life. I know that I am a sinner, that I cannot save myself. I no longer want to close the door of my life to you. I am ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my savior and my Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you have said that prayer for the first time, or you felt the need to say it a second or third time, congratulations. Congratulations. I'm glad. I rejoice with you. Thank you, Jesus. Going further with the message, I said, at the presence of God, four things happened to Isaiah. The first one was worship. The second one was repentance. The third one is cleansing. 
If you look at verse 6 and verse 7 of our text today, Isaiah chapter 6, it reads, Then one of the seraphim flew to him, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. One of the seraphim flew to him. One of the seraphims that were above, flying above the throne of God flew to Isaiah with a live coal in a tongue that he had taken from the altar. Obviously, the, the coal was hot. And that's the reason why even the angel used a tongue to pick it from the altar. The throne of God is where he rules and reigns. The altar of God is for us where we find cleansing and purging from sin. You have, we have to know the difference. The angel took the coal and touched Isaiah's lips with it. In the human sense, we will say this must have been painful. A burning hot coal applied to his lips. The lips is one of the most sensitive parts of the body. But the pain did not matter. I believe because of the majesty of the surroundings and the goodness of the cleansing, the pain did not matter. God began to do a work of transformation in the life of Isaiah. A work of cleansing. A work of sanctification. He cleansed him from his guilt. He cleansed him from everything that made him to say, I am undone. The call on his lips consumed the fleshly power that he had been inspired by. Isaiah's lips was transformed. His life was transformed. The Bible says in James chapter 3 verse 2b, that if anyone does not stumble in words, he's a perfect man. And so the angel touching his lips with the, um, the cold, hot coal for purification was making Isaiah a perfect man. He was totally transformed. He was transformed in the presence of God. Maybe you are looking for something to change in your life. There is something that needs to be transformed in your life. Your senses cannot do it. Your willpower cannot do it. It is the presence of God that transforms. Maybe you are struggling with a besetting sin. Maybe you are struggling with a particular lifestyle. There's something you are struggling with and you feel I cannot do it. It is true you cannot do it. It's only his presence that can transform. Hallelujah. And so today I want to encourage you to seek his presence. In his presence, transformation comes. The angel touched the, the lips with the hot coal. And there is no record that Isaiah expressed pain. As the Lord begins to prune us in his presence, as the Lord begins to trim us in his presence, there may be pain, but because of his presence, because of the majesty of his presence, because of the goodness of the work that he is doing, we will have fortitude to bear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lastly, the first thing that we see in this encounter with the presence of God that Isaiah had was service. The first one is worship. The second one is repentance. The third one is cleansing. The fourth one was service. Isaiah's motivation was of, for service was born out of the time that he spent in God's presence. It was during these precious moments that God was able to reveal his heart to Isaiah and to impact the vision. Do you want to hear the heart of God? Do you want to receive a vision from the Lord? It is in the presence of God that you hear his heart. It is in the presence of God that he imparts a vision. Without you staying in the presence of God, dwelling in the presence of God, there is no vision and you cannot hear the heart of God. You do not, well, I'm not talking about visiting the presence of God. 
I'm not talking about going to say hello in the presence of God. I'm talking about staying and dwelling in the presence of God. You will not receive a vision by calculation or permutations. You will not receive here the heart of God by sensing. If you must hear God's call, if you must do his will, you must seek the presence of God. You must live and dwell in his presence. Isaiah wrote in verse 8 of the 6th chapter of, I, of the book of Isaiah. He says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? Then I said, here am I. If send me. If Isaiah was not in the presence of God, he would not have heard the call, who shall we send and who shall go for us? How strange it is for God to ask a question at all. What does God wonder about? What question would he have? What does God not know? But God was asking a person because God wants to reach the world. He wants to reach it through willing people. And so he asked the question to Isaiah. He wasn't looking for the answers for himself. He knows the answer. He was asking this question because Isaiah was standing right there, right there in his presence. Would you go and stand right there in his presence so that you can hear his voice today? Whom shall we send? When he said, whom shall we send? This means who is the missionary that we will send? Who is that Christian worker? Who is the witness of our Lord Jesus Christ that we will send? This was a divine commission. Isaiah's response was, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. One may wonder, what created this kind of heart in Isaiah? First, he had a heart that had been in the presence of God. He had a heart that knew his own sinfulness and what he was humble. He had a heart that knew he needed the need among the people, the need for God's word. He had a heart that had been touched by God's cleansing fire. He had a heart that God's heart to, uh, uh, th that, that's God's heart to reach the nations. Do you have that kind of heart? A heart that has been in the presence of God? Do you have that kind of heart that knows your own sinfulness and is humbled? Do you have that kind of heart that knows the need of man, the need for God's word? Do you have that kind of heart that has been touched by God's cleansing fire? and has been set on fire by the, by the almighty God. Do you have that kind of heart? That kind of heart that wants to reach the nations. Your success in serving God and fulfilling his vision for your life depends on you making time to stay in his presence so that he will create that kind of heart that Isaiah has in your heart. And then you can receive a vision and then you can be obedient to the vision. And then you can be bold to relate the message. And then you can persevere for the completion of the vision. In conclusion this morning, God's presence is of utmost importance to the life of every Christian. In fact, to the life of every human being. The reason why we have people come to fellowship year in year, month in month, month out, week in week out, without any sign of transformation taking place in them is because they are not seeking or staying in God's presence. The presence of God transforms. You cannot encounter the presence of God and stay the same. It is potent for transformation. God desires to reveal himself to all who seek him. But will you seek him? James chapter 4 verse 8 says, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. Draw near to the Lord today in your prayer. He will draw near to you. Know that one moment in the presence of God will spoil you and transform your life forever. You won't be satisfied with religion anymore. You will hunger for more and more. Your desire will be to serve him. You will be consumed by the zeal of the Lord. You may 
even respond to the Lord the way Isaiah respond and countless others have responded in the past. Here am I, send me. <laughs> 